please welcome to the TEDx Sonoma County stage, Dr. Hobie Wedler. Hi there. <laughs> I want you to join me and imagine being in a field, standing there on a foggy spring morning in southern Sonoma County. The visual is striking and commands your full attention. But what other information do your other four senses offer you? It has nothing to do with vision. You can hear the birds chirping in the trees, cows moo in the distance, and the, you can feel the viscosity of the air on your face coming from the thick fog. Smells of bay, eucalyptus, and redwood trees mingle with manure, alfalfa, and fresh cut grass to form an aromatic symphony that is nothing short of beautiful. The ground is soft and yielding beneath your feet from the winter rains. If my white cane didn't give it away, I'm completely blind. And I was born this way. I stood in this field that I just described many years ago with a group of sighted friends. They could not stop talking about the view. They all wanted to describe the vista to me, even trying to describe what the color green looked like. Frankly, I didn't really care what the color green looked like <laughs> because of all the sensory information that I was getting non-visually. When we got back in the car, I asked them to, or I decided to explain to them what I noticed about the surroundings. Surprisingly to me, they noticed none of this. They were so focused on the visual that they were incapable of looking beyond eyesight. Eyesight is a valuable sense, indeed, that tells us a great deal about the world around us. But it can be distracting, and it can cause our other senses, if we're not careful, to go dormant. I've seen this in my clients. This experience in the field, along with countless others, helped me to understand sensory design. But before we address sensory design, we need to talk about sensory literacy. What is sensory literacy? I believe that every thoughtful person should be able to take in data from all five of their senses, process that data, and then intelligently draw conclusions or predictions. We're all visually literate. If you see an orange cat, you know it's orange, it's a cat, and if it did any cat-like thing, you wouldn't be alarmed. If you look at a beautiful vineyard in the distance, you know you're looking at a vineyard. But how often have you been going about your daily life when you catch a familiar smell on the air? You know it, but you can't think of what it is. It's like having a word on the tip of your tongue that you can't quite think of. Inherently, because we use vision so much, we're more literate in that than we are in our other senses. I urge you to try to become more literate, as literate as possible, in your other senses. And like anything in life, we can't do that unless we practice those other senses. Smell things, feel things, listen to them, focus in on them. I recently received my PhD from the University of California, Davis, in organic chemistry. Concurrently with graduate school, I hosted tasting events, and I still do, which temporarily remove eyesight. You'll see one of those in a bit. Ultimately, I realized that I have a deep love and passion for both art and science. And what I'm doing with my career is I'm trying to shape it such that it straddles this intersection, this very fine line between art and science. I call that sensory design. Simply put, Art fills our toolbox with many useful tools, 
So, excuse me. Science fills our toolbox with many useful tools, and art refers to how we use those tools. When you hear the word sensory, what initially comes to mind? For me, I used to think of sensory as confined only to the food and drink world. I have since realized that sensory is so far beyond food and beverage. We live it. We breathe it. Literally everything around us, from my voice, to the smell of the theater, to the way the carpet feels beneath your feet, everything is sensory. The following examples only scratch the surface of what I do as a sensory designer, and I hope they illustrate the depth and reach of this field. Take a look at these two coffee cups. You're 10 minutes late to work, but you still stop at that coffee shop because you need your little caffeine, and you get a surprisingly high-quality cup of joe in that paper-to-go cup with a flimsy lid and a tiny drinking hole. I guarantee you the experience of drinking that coffee is entirely different than the experience of drinking the exact same cup of coffee out of the beautiful ceramic mug on holiday reading a Sunday paper would be. My only point here is that our understanding of that coffee and our perception of it, and anything really, is highly dependent on a multitude of sensory and psychological inputs far beyond the cup and what's in it. Would you ever think of drinking wine straight out of the bottle, like we might take a slug of beer? <laughs> Society's led us to believe that we need this funny-shaped glass to properly enjoy wine. Why is beer not the same? At the reception in a few minutes, I urge each and every one of you to step behind that bar, <laughs> grab a bottle of wine, and take a swig right out of it. You're gonna be judged for it, but why? Why are you gonna be judged? To switch gears a little bit, let's now listen to first the sound of an entry level and then a luxury automobile door shutting. Entry level. Luxury. I'll play them again, and what differences do you hear? Entry level, luxury. Clearly the luxury manufacturer has put more attention into making the so sound of their door shutting quieter and a bit more complete, right? The entry, the entry level car door shuts with much more of a clatter, a chunk. Next time you pick out a car, I bet that a lot, a multitude of non-visual and frankly, fairly subconscious sensory data will play in to your buying decision, including the sound and the feel of the door. We think we buy cars because we like the lines, we like the way they look, but we're really buying them for many reasons, a lot of them being the subconscious, non-visual sensory in inputs that we receive. Now I wanna show you sensory design in action. I wanted to give each and every one of you a glass of wine, but the theater wouldn't let me. So that means that if you want to see this for yourself, I guess you're going to have to buy me a drink. <laughs> it's thus my great pleasure to welcome to the stage my dear friend, Dr. Charles Pyle, who chairs the School of Illustration at the, Acal the Academy of Arts University in San Francisco. Chuck, welcome. Hey, Hobie. Happy to be you here. Look, you look sharp today, by the way. Hey, everybody. <laughs> By the way, this painting that you see, Chuck is, a, is an accomplished longtime painter, and you see one of his images up here. Chuck, I particularly love this one. Thank you, Hope. It's beautiful. <laughs> now, I live, I live under a blindfold, but Chuck doesn't. Chuck is a very visual person in his career, and uh, uses vision every day to paint these beautiful things. But now you're gonna spend the next few minutes under blindfold, if you don't mind. Great, I'm gonna go blind. Go ahead blind. and put it on. on there stage. you go. Oh. My goodness. As <laughs> aside from that sound of the rainforest that you just heard, one of my favorite clips from the Amazon, what do you feel right now, Chuck? How does this space feel to you? My ears reach out in front, 
of my head and the room fills in from the sides. Yeah, you can hear the vastness of the audience in front of you. Mm -hmm. I'm just reminding you of that, just in case Thank you, you. could. Yeah, 750 no friends. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Chuck, on the table in front of you, you have two glasses. By the way, anyone who wants to give a TEDx talk in the future, I encourage doing it with wine. <laughs> we're gonna find the glass on the left. Go ahead and, you got it? Mm -hmm. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and lift it up and <laughs> smell it. Ah, what do you smell? Hmm, a little apple. Apple? What about those beautiful minerals we talk minerals. about? Few minerals, but the apple that Chuck pointed out is really more of a browning apple smell. Take a green apple, cut it in half, and set it on the counter for a few hours. It begins to get a browning mm. essence going. By the way, you all get to see what Chuck's drinking. He doesn't know. Let's go ahead and taste it. Mm. Mm. Now, how does it feel on your palate? Um, a little dry. A little my, bit dry, meaning, meaning you know, less sugar. Less sugar, the sides of my tongue are being constricted. There's mm. a little bitterness there that's just perfect. And a beautiful oak. oak. What about that, that nice fruit that comes through, that Delicious apple? Delicious fruit, the apple. Toasted going. hazelnuts. Mm -hmm. And almost a minerality, which we call petrichor, like wet rain or wet pavement after the mm -hmm. rain. I live near Chuck, and he sees, sees me sniffing pavement all the time, and that's why I know that smell. Just <laughs> <laughs> true. You, you caught me in the gutter. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Chuck, what color do you think this is? It's got to be white. Absolutely. Good job. And what's the varietal? It has to be a Chardonnay. He's a natural. It's a Chardonnay indeed from Dutton Estate Winery, our dear friends out in Sebastopol. Hmm. Lovely. Let's go on to the red wine here. <laughs> Let's go on to the second wine here. <laughs> I gave you that one. I, I just didn't think you could do it. Chuck. I had to give you that it's one. It's not a rosé. You know, well, it's actually, now I'm smelling it. It's actually an IPA. Mm. <laughs> I'll chug. What does it smell like? Oh, dense summer fruits, a little sugar. Kind of a brilliant thing, though, with this wine. Mm -hmm. Don't you notice, like, a dark fruit, dark mm -hmm. cherry, plum, mm -hmm. blackberry, etc., mixed with these really bright, vibrant fruits. Mm -hmm. Fresh cranberry, like on the Thanksgiving table. Yes. Let's taste it. And with this one, I want you to breathe a little bit of air through it. We call this aspiration. Mm. Mm. Tannins. Mm -hmm. A bit of astringency that's so natural. Mm -hmm. What else do you notice? Fruit. You know, there's a characteristic of wine oh, like this, God. which is cherry cola. cherry cola. And there's that beautiful almost black cherry mixed with that lemon, lime, hmm. cinnamon, and vanilla kind yes. of thing going. Yes. Gorgeous wine. Absolutely. What color is this? Uh, red. <laughs> I think it's a red. It must and be. what's the varietal? This has to be a fabulous Sonoma County Pinot. It absolutely is. This is a mm. Pinot Noir made by Kathleen Inman. It's her estate OGV Pinot from her property out on Piner Road. Mm. Chuck, you've done a very abbreviated, abbreviated version of this. Usually I take these for about an hour to an hour and a half. But what did you think of it? What, and, and how do you feel with the blindfold now that we've done this? Well, I'm a visual artist and I look for beauty in everything around me. It reminds me that great wine, like great art, shares beauty with us, only using different sensory channels. And now, when I go back out into the real world, the sighted world, I'm going to have to use all of my other channels a lot more. Absolutely. Chuck, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you for joining me. Let's hear, it for, let's hear it for Dr. Pyle. We use vision for 85 to 90% of the information we acquire about our surroundings. That means that we have four other perfectly good senses to obtain 10 to 15% of the information around us. That's a lot of senses and not very much information. I know eyesight is very valuable, and if you have it, you should definitely use it. <laughs> With that said, I hope my remarks have allowed you to open your mind to the rich and more full opportunity that life can, can offer and be like if you use all five of your senses. 
You may ask how it feels to experience the non-visual world so profoundly. If you've ever experienced true love, you've experienced this feeling. True, deep, compassionate love is so rich, intense, and unlike anything else. This is the closest I can come to describing the richness, fulfillment, and beauty I feel every day as I navigate the world around me without vision. We live right now in a society that can be limited, thinking about the theme of this conference, a world without limits. And I tell you that as a blind person, some might think of my lack of eyesight as a limit. It has made my world drop limits. I feel like the world is so open to me. And I think that if we all work together to use our senses in a very positive way, you too and we all will notice that we are living a life that is less limited and richer. Next time you drive to the coast, drive anywhere, or really do anything, roll down the windows, smell the air, feel the, ha- the wind in your hair, and be a sensitive and absorbent to everything that's going on around you. Trust your eyesight, but not so much that it makes your other senses lazy. Thank you very much.